All right. On behalf of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission and the Effort of Cloister Associates, welcome to tonight's Virtual Effort Academy program. For those of you not familiar with the Effort of Cloister, this community was founded in 1732 by German immigrant Conrad Beisel and consisted of celibate members as well as married members and their families. Education was always important at Ephrata. As early as 1742, Brother Ovid conducted classes for the children of the married members. Later, the community constructed the Ephrata Academy, which eventually became a public school. At this time, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Ephrata Cloisters curator, Carrie Moan, who will be presenting an illustrated history of postcards with Ephrata Cloister and other views. Okay, Carrie, I'm going to get, turn it over to you and everyone enjoy the program. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone for tuning in tonight to the Effort Academy, the Virtual Effort Academy. Uh, the program tonight is similar to a program that I gave about five years ago to the Effort of Cloister Winter History class. And some of you that are tuning in tonight may have seen that program at that time, but this program is a little different. I added a few things, took some out, reordered the whole, all the slides and um, um, did a little more research into certain things. And I would think I was about as ready as I could be for this. Everything was in order. Got my car inspected today, needed a new battery, got that back on time. Um, left the house, started up, rounded the corner at the end of the block and a black cat ran in front of me. So now I'm a little nervous, but um, I think we'll, um, we'll get through this. I call this a, a short history of postcards because we're going to basically um, cover the, maybe the most high points of postcard history. Uh, if you're interested in more information, um, I encourage you to go to the chat box and uh, download uh, two documents that are posted in there. One of them is um, a um, short history of postcards with a little bit more of a description. The other one is a postcard timeline, which contains much more history uh, than we'll probably get into tonight. But let me quick run down what you expect to see here tonight. Um, 1873, the view, the view that, um, well, we'll get to that in a moment. 1873, the United States government issued its first postal card, not quite called a postcard at this time. It was known as a postal card. It was a government issued card. In 1874, the Universal Postal Union was formed and the Postal Union um, was a, a major convenience between all the countries around the world that prior to the Universal Postal Union had to enter into agreements with each other for the exchange of mail. This, this uh, made it uh, equal all around the world, made uh, simplified things. One thing that came out of that agreement though in 1874 was that postcards was set, the standard size for postcards was set at three and a half by five and a half. And that size card was used for a very long time. Eighteen ninety-three was really the first time in this country where you started to really see picture postcards, and that was before the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in eighteen ninety-three. People were printing souvenir cards uh, as uh, something to take home from the exposition. Consequently, then you had other companies seeing this printing cards from about 1893 to 1897 was the so-called souvenir postcard era. In 1898, uh, the Congress officially made um, or created the use of private mailing cards. Uh, 1901 to 1907 is what we call the undivided back era. And I'll get into a little bit more of that when I show you an example. But basically the message, if there was a message, was on the front of the card, address only on the back of the card. In 1907, the law was changed and um, so-called undivided backs on cards were, were allowed. On an undivided back, there was a, 
space for the message and a space for the address. Usually the, the address uh, was on the right, message on the left. In 1907, um, the divided back era uh, starts and that era was also known as the golden age of postcards up till about 1915. 1915, 1930, we have what we call the white border era. A couple of th major worldwide events happened in 1914, uh, the beginning of the world, First World War. Many of the postcards that were sold in the United States were printed in Germany. And those postcard producers in the United States got most of their ink from Germany as well. Well, the war disrupted that, that flow. The British blockade of, uh, of Germany uh, had a, a huge impact on uh, German uh, trade, particularly with the United States, until we entered the war. So postcard producers in the United States started to print their own cards. But because of um, some amount of um, rationing and shortages and things, the white border era came around. Instead of bleeding the ink to the edges of the cards, cards then were produced with a white border. Um, and it's very distinctive, and you'll see that. Beginning in 1930, 1950, uh, linen cards uh, came into use. Linen cards had a texture like linen or like cloth. They actually were not made out of linen or cloth, but that was the texture of the card, and that's where the name came from. And they were popular uh, for about 20 years or so uh, until uh, what they call photochrome or chrome cards came into use in 1939. Eventually over time, chrome cards overtook linen cards. And that's what we have today. We have um, what we call photochrome or chrome cards today. 1970, more and more uh, in the United States, continental size cards became into use. Now the old standard size was three and a half by five and a half. And there are very few producers today that produce cards that size. I know of one postcard producer in Berks County that still will issue a card in the old standard size, but he also does continental size cards too. Um, and finally, uh, in the 1990s, um, you, people started to see the use of rack cards as a postcard. Um, standard size rack card to be to put into a rack somewhere um, to advertise a place, but on the back they had it printed so it looked like a postcard and you could actually mail it if you'd like. Okay, let's look at a few pictures now. This is an example of the very first United States postal card. Now there were attempts before this to issue cards that had very, very limited use. This was a US government issue. And to this day yet, I believe they, the government issues are referred to as postal cards. Other types of picture postcards issued privately are postcards. That was in 1873, by the way, the very, very first US postal card was issued. I included this uh, picture here um, because of the Universal Postal Union back on this card. This is from the 20th century. It wasn't, it's not from the 1870s, but as you can see, uh, the name or the word postcard is in a much different languages. Um, and you can even see Union Postal Universal on the third line. And, two different languages and even postcard on the third line in English. Uh, this was a huge leap forward in um, the exchange of mail among countries, standardizing it around the world. Here's an example of a souvenir postcard. Now this would have been issued between 1893 and 1897. And it says very clearly on there that it is a souvenir card. Another example of a souvenir mail card from that period of time, um, 1893, 1897. One thing I want to mention at this point is, even though we sort of have these um, eras of postcard use or defined by dates, nevertheless, there was a certain amount of overlap between these. You will see cards, older cards still being used, you know, maybe well after the new version uh, came out. These two cards here are as an example of a um, 
postcard back that actually has the date uh, enacted by Congress to create the next era, the private mailing card era. Private mailing cards exa uh, existed from about 1898 to 1901. The top card didn't say private mailing card, but it does give the act creating the use of private mailing cards. Picture cards printed by private, um, private publishers for use uh, by the public. The bottom card is another private mailing card, but as you can see on there, even though it includes the date of the act by Congress is May 19th, um, 1898, uh, the card is stamped, you know, March 26th, 1908, 10 years later. This is sort of a good example of how uh, this card was used uh, quite a bit after the time uh, that uh, styles changed. Another example of a, a private mailing card with the Act of Congress, of course, uh, put on the back. And as you can see, the one side was exclusively for the address. The other side, you know, may have had a picture or maybe an advertisement or something like that. We're gonna, next, uh, we're gonna look at um, some examples of real photo postcards. Real photo postcards were first used in 1899, but most, um, really took off as, uh, for, in use in 1903. In 1903, Eastman Kodak developed a camera that took a postcard size uh, negative. You could then take the negative and have the print, uh, you know, printed out on um, cardboard stock that had a postcard back. That was in 1903. Uh, real photo postcards are still with us today. They may not be used as much as maybe they were in the past, uh, but they are still with us today. And actually, real photo postcards uh, kept postcard use going even at a time when uh, white borders came in and even during the, the depression of World War II era, you know, you still had uh, a certain amount of uh, postcard use that was kept going by the use of real photo postcards. This is an example of an early, uh, the date on the card is 1904, but this is an example of a, an early real photo postcard, often referred to as RPPC, real photo postcard. Real, the early real photo postcards uh, had a small picture on the front. In a moment, you'll see uh, uh, what happened um, as, as time went on, how, how real photos developed. This, by the way, is the promenade in front of uh, the old main at uh, what is now Kutztown University. Now here is um, an example of a real photo postcard, probably taken maybe by one of those little Eastman Kodak cameras. Uh, as you can see, the picture is completely printed to the edges. This is a group of people at what I suspect is a Sabbath school picnic uh, among the members of the effort of German Seventh-day Baptist Church. It's hard, hard to identify some of the folks in there, but uh, we can pick out a few people uh, in this view, very likely taken on the grounds, but the photo is not identified as to place. I suspect it was on the grounds of the cloister at that time. Uh, just a couple of people I'll point out to you on here. Um, this is William Y. Zerfus, who was a longtime member of, of the German Seventh-day Baptist Church. Uh, this is his wife right here, Annie Stout Zerfus. This is her brother, Charles Stout. And uh, sometimes when I'm looking at photos like this, it's hard to determine a little bit what, what might be the date for this. Well, Charles Stout was the last person to live in the, in the Saren at the East End in uh, like what it was an apartment. He died in 1917. So oftentimes if you see a photo that Charles Stout appears in, you know it was prior to 1917. Uh, and probably, and certainly this picture is, is taken before 1917. This is Katie Wade, who was the superintendent of the Sabbath school um, at the Ephra Cloister.
I'm sure this was taken the same day, same group uh, sitting down to eat, probably somewhere on the grounds. Unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of these folks, it's hard to identify them today. Although there's Charles Stout, uh, he must have moved during the picture because he's a little bit of a blur. This is Katie Wade in the background here, the Sabbath School Superintendent. Another real photo postcard. This is Lizzie Weicker, who was a sister to uh, the minister of Sam Grant Zerfus. She is sitting uh, with the uh, what was known as the parsonage behind her. And with her is Minnie, Minnie Mae Zerfus, Sam Grant's daughter, and his son, Theodore Zerfus. This is their cousin, uh, Dan Cockle. Um, unfortunately, Sam Grant Service's wife died in 1907, and then uh, his sister Lizzie Weicker helped to look after the children uh, who were still very small. This was developed on a postcard stock that left, they left some message space on the front, even though this card is a divided back card. Here's Minnie Mae Zerfus and her brother Theodore Zerfus. Um, the little uh, the little wheelbarrow that looks like it has their dad's hat on it. Uh, this was taken on the grounds of the cloister. Another real photo view. This is Annie Stout Zerfus, William Young Zerfus's wife. Um, she was from the Wobblesdorf area. Her and her brother were from the Wobblesdorf area. This is a portrait, like a studio portrait view. Uh, that was taken professionally, and then you could order whatever you wanted as, uh, as far as prints and things. You could then get a postcard and mail it to people if you like. A view of um, the Reverend John Pence and his wife Ida taken in front of the Zoll. John Pence uh, was... Um, an ordained minister in the German Seventh-day Baptist Church. He was ordained in 1895. He later in 1908 became the bishop of the German Seventh-day Baptist Church. He was often at Ephra. He, while he uh, was the minister at Snow Hill in Franklin County, he nevertheless spent a lot of time here and he often would come to preach. And in some cases when there was a death in, in the Zerfus family or in the, a death in one of the members of the Ephra congregation, he would come and preach the service. He would conduct the service. Uh, John Pence died in 1940. This is a very curious card, uh, again, um, identified as the, the home of Peter Miller. It's one of the two buildings that we have pictures of that no longer survive at the cloister. Now, as you can see, this postcard has room on the front for a message, uh, but it is an undivided back card, which means you could write the message and the address on the back. But what's also curious about this view is that the picture might have been as many as 10 years old when this card was printed. Uh, the so-called Peter Miller House was demolished in the late 1890s, and um, uh, for some reason, somebody wanted a postcard view of the building. So they left a message on the front and a message on the back. Um, and the card is uh, that the card's probably after 1907. So it could be 10 years after it was demolished. You see that sometimes with some early uh, real photo cards in like the first decade of the 20th century. You'll see sometimes views that were made into a card that might have been 20, 30 years ago. There's a nice view of the Effort Academy facing Main Street. In the background is what we, what was known as the Parsonage at that time, where um, uh, Sam Grant Zerfus, the minister, lived. Today we interpret that building as the Weaver's House. Keep this uh, view in mind a little bit as we go along, because we'll see we'll see some similar views. The cloister certainly over the years attracted a lot of people and uh, people came here to see this place because they were curious about it. 
This was a view taken uh, by W.W. Um, Dietrich from Kutztown, Pennsylvania. He was a professor at the Keystone State Normal School, now Kutztown University. He apparently carried his camera all around with him wherever he went, and he probably took several thousand views. Not all of them might have been made into postcards, but he um, took many his views of historical places, uh, of gatherings of people. He, he kind of documented to some degree life around the Kutztown area. Uh, he went to auctions and, and took pictures of um, the vendue, as they called it at that time. Um, he took many photos of uh, student performances at Kutztown or events happening around Kutztown or uh, buildings in, in Kutztown and the neighboring area. Uh, very prolific issuer of postcards. Not, I wouldn't call him a publisher, but um, you know, certainly on his own, he had these made of the photos that he took. This is a particularly interesting view of um, the Saren and the Zoll in the background because of all the fencing and what appear to be gardens and things uh, that are in the foreground. Now keep in mind that uh, the driveway to the cloister was put through this, near this area here, through what you see there. Uh, driveway's in there somewhere now. But this is sort of a long, a long distance view. He said it was from the highway. This next view was taken by Dietrich again, and a little bit of a close-up of the, of the Zoll, a little bit of the bakery on the left, Zoll kitchen, uh, the stone addition there, and you can see a little bit of the, the sarin on the right. One thing to note on here is uh, he also caught a cat sitting on the step, and we today have a cat that um, hangs around the property, you might say, uh, Froben uh, is the name of the cat. Um, one thing to keep in mind here, too, is this steeple on top of the Zoll with uh, the church bell. That moved around a little bit um, on the property between the, the Zoll, the meeting house, and the sister's house. One way to, to let me mention at this point, too, one way to help to date cards that aren't dated is, is of course, if they were postmarked, you'd have the postmark to go by. It'll give you an idea about when that card was issued. But on a real photo postcard, if the card was not used, there's been a lot of research into the stamp block up in the corner. Over the years, different styles of uh, paper makers or card stock makers put different designs in that stamp block where the stamp was to go. And uh, by looking that over carefully, and you can find all this information online, you can sort of get a rough idea when maybe that card was printed on that, on that uh, cardboard stock. The steeple up here, as you see in this view, is on the, uh, in, on the, on the Zoll. I have one more view uh, taken by, um, by W.W. W. Dietrich, uh, September 5th, 1919. You'll notice by this time that steeple is now on the Sarin. Going back to the early 20th century, uh, the Historical Society of Berks County used to have pilgrimages to different historical areas, and Dietrich often went along and recorded that. This is a card that he took in September 1919 of uh, the Berks County historians visiting the cloister. They probably also visited somewhere else that day in the, in the neighborhood, you might say. Dietrich had a very distinctive style of, lay, of putting captions on his cards, and sometimes that's very helpful uh, if his name is not on the back. We're now going to take a look at some examples of um, the undivided back era cards. This is where you had the message on the front, um, address on the back. This is an example of a um, undivided back card. Uh, this view here is a very, very common postcard view of the Saren in the rear of the Saren and Zoll. You'll notice there's the area for the message. On the back, the message went under the whole thing here. This is printed by uh, Rotocraft, which was a German company. Another undivided back card. 
of the Zal. Message says, can't you see Mr. Zerfus? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. It could have meant Sam Grant Zerfus, the minister. It could have meant his father, Joseph Josiah Royer Zerfus. But maybe it, maybe it was uh, Joseph Josiah Royer Zerfus. Maybe gave them a car. Uh, I mean, a, a, not a car, a tour. And uh, the person mailed this and put that message on it. These two chairs are in the collection today, and they often appear in postcard views. Uh, this is the chair, of course, that uh, uh, allegedly George Washington sat in. Another example of a um, undivided back postcard. What's great about this postcard is it has people in it. Over here on the right, you can see uh, this is uh, the owner of the Mountain Springs Hotel. This is Dan Vanita or Vanita, owner of Mountain Springs. And on the right is Joseph Josiah Royer Zerfus, who at the time this card was, was published was living in the east end of the Saren, and you might say a, an apartment there. Uh, he died in 1911, and uh, that Charles Stout that we looked at we saw earlier moved into that area until his death in 1917. Interesting point in time that the photographer uh, captured those two together on this postcard. Another um, view of the rear of the Sarens all published by L.B. Herr in Lancaster, uh, a very prolific postcard publisher. The message on this card says, if you can't read it very well, these houses were built before the Revolution, Revolutionary War. In them is a pitcher that George Washington and his soldiers drank from and other things that were used then. It's very interesting to know that there was a chair that Washington sat in and also a pitcher here that he drank out of. Um, unknown today, um, what happened to that picture, uh, or maybe it's here and uh, everybody forgot which one it was. Another view, um, an undivided view of the brother's house, Bethania, or Bethania in the German pronunciation, by the Rotograph Company. This is a hand colored card. Now keep in mind that this card was printed in Germany based on a black and white photo. So while they were hand coloring this with a little bit of watercolor, they certainly didn't know what color uh, things were. Now they could guess right on a tree, I think, or even on the grass, but uh, they made the roof red. Maybe they thought it was a tile roof, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they colored the roof red. This isn't the first time this happened on different views, uh, they, the different colors are used. They made the building gray, which probably was close enough. Effort a monument on an undivided back card. It's a little bit easy to identify the date of this card. It was not postally used. The, um, as you can see in the front here, the ordinance of the cannonballs and the two howitzers were given to the Effort a Monument Association in 1890s. 1896, I believe it was, 95, 96. And as you can see, that's where they put them. They, they put two, two stacks here, and then there was one at each quarter of the monument. In 1905, two more guns were given to the Effort of Monument Association. Those guns were placed, one here on the street side, and one in the back. Now, these guns are not there yet. So the monument was dedicated in 1902. The other guns were received in 1905. So this is a pretty early view of the Ephraim Monument in the, gods, in the Mount Zion Cemetery. What I also like about this view is the fact you can see where the original location of the, of the flagpole is, is. Today, there's a flagpole on the street side of the monument. And this is the last example of the undivided back cards. This is a pretty special card in the collection. As you can see in the front there, it says compliments of S.G. Zerfus, who was the German Seventh-day Baptist congregation minister. Picture of the, the Saren, a little bit of the Zoll there over here on the right. 
This one has uh, some glitter added to it, outlining the grassy area here, outlining the arbor, the roof of the tree here, the roof line of the sarin. Uh, and there's even, you can't really tell very well, but there's a little bit of glitter around this doorway and also uh, the entrance to the cellar on the, the west end of the sarin. Um, this was sent by uh, Sam Grant Zerfus to Edwin Spangler, Edwin Royer Spangler. Edwin Spangler and Theodore Zerfus, Sam Grant's son, were friends. This was sent to Edwin Spangler on the occasion of his 13th birthday. Spangler had a, and maybe because of this relationship early on, later in 1935, Edwin Spangler was elected to the state legislature uh, from Ephrata. And in his first term of office, he introduced the legislation for the purchase of the Ephrata cloister uh, by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Edwin, um, Edwin Spangler was a, uh, a pharmacist by trade uh, before he was elected to the state house. Unfortunately, he passed away during his first term in 1935. The legislation was carried through um, or saw through by Baker Royer, his successor in the legislature from the Ephrata area. The, of course, the, the cloister was purchased by the Commonwealth on May 27th, 1941. You can see that this was canceled on April 23rd, 1906. Now we're going to take a look at some of uh, the, the divided back area cards. Now, if you remember, I'm going to go back one more time. You take a look at that view and we'll take a look at this view. That is the same view, same stock number, but as you can see, Without having to have a message area on the front, the whole the photo is bled to the edges. The, the image is bled to the edges. Um, quite a bit for different view, uh, a little bit of grass there in the front as a caption here. Now you'll notice though on the back that this card is divided for address only. This space says may be used for correspondence by the Rotograph Company. Same view, divided back card. The other one was the undivided back card. Another um, divided back era card uh, from the so-called golden age of postcards. This is JJR Zerfus again on the south side of the Zoll. Sort of printed in a monochrome. It's um, a little bit off white. Um, good view though of the uh, Saren kitchen here added to the, excuse me, the Zoll kitchen added to the, the Zoll, the meeting house. Sam Grant Surface living, uh, standing on the porch of the Parsonage. Parsonage today is now interpreted as the Weaver, Weaver, the Weaver's house. Sam Grant uh, was the minister here. He was ordained in 1904 and he died in 1929. Um, his children, of course, were Minnie Mae and uh, Theodore Zerfus. God's Acre is just off to the side here, the cemetery all, all along Main Street. One thing you might want to pick out here is the fact that all the windows have been made into double hung, you know, they've been made larger into double hung windows. That window right there is an original size window that's, of course, still there today. This view here is a particularly interesting one to me because I don't know, I know in our collection, our photo collection here at the Cloister, we do not have a view of the gate to the God's Acre Cemetery from the street side. And here it is right here. Also a great view of what was called the Parsonage at the time, now the Weaver's house. You can see that it had an addition out the back, which I suspect was the kitchen where the cook stove was. You can see a chimney there. Uh, and God's Acre is here, of course, with a stone wall around it. Um, in about the next 10, 15 years or so, that wall is going to disappear mostly, and you'll see that in a moment. This card was sold in Ephrata by the 5 and not just 5 and 10, but the 5, 10, and 25 cent store.
And this is the last of our divided back era cards, a uh, nice shot of the uh, Effort Academy building. Uh, sometimes on some of these uh, captions that were put on by the publishers, they sort of goofed them up a little bit and I don't have any explanation of that. Uh, this obviously says uh, at Academy was founded in 1857. Now we know it was founded in 1837. Uh, how that happened is a mystery today. We're going to now look at a few examples of the white border era, which was about 1915 to 1930. You'll notice um, almost right away that the stone wall disappeared in the meantime between those two public cards were published. And the stone wall in front of uh, on the street side of um, God's Acres also dis disappeared replaced by this iron fence. You can see a little bit of that stone wall, earlier stone wall in the back here. And of course, here's the bakery building, the meeting house, and the sarin. You'll notice that the steeple is now on, is on the sarin here as well. By the way, Beisel's burial is right here. Postcard view of a little bit of God's Acre and um, the Sarin and Zoll, published by uh, H. Winslow Fegley of Reading, who was a prolific, prolific um, postcard publisher, had a stationary store in Reading. He was originally from the eastern part of Birds County in Hereford, uh, took a huge amount of photos, of which are now in the collection of the Goschenhofen historians. Um, once again, um, some of the captions here are a little, a, little, a little bit incorrect, although the buildings erected 1735-46 is okay. Printing presses operated in these buildings, well, maybe not quite in these buildings, as early as 1742, which may be a little early. Continental money printed here at 1777-78. Well, we know that's not the case. Steeple, of course, has been, you know, in this view too, has been moved to the Sarin. I suspect it was moved to the Sarin in the neighborhood of 1915 or so from the Zoll. It was right over here, if you remember, on the Zoll, the meeting house. On the back of the pendulum of the tower clock that at one time was on the third floor of the Sarin prior to the restoration, on the back of that pendulum, there was a, to weight the pendulum down, there, there was lead in the back of that. It is, it's brass in the front, lead on the back. Scratched on the back, it says, this clock has been restored by Joseph, Josiah, uh, excuse me, Joseph Clarence Zerfus, 1915. And I suspect that was about the same time that they put the, the, the steeple up here with the bell and, and, and put the clock uh, on the third floor. Another um, white border view of the Ephraim Cloister. Um, in this view, the bakery building is very prominently located, uh, maybe more so. It has a green roof. I uh, really can't explain that one. And you can see the buildings have different colors to it. Once again, they were working from a black and white photo. And maybe you didn't really know what, you know, what the, the buildings were colored, what color they were. Another white border card, but in this case here, this is black and white. I thinking that this card was issued more towards 1930 and into the depression era. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, when we got to the depression area into the World War II area, um, postcard production went down and many cards were, were published uh, in monochrome, usually black and white. This is the same view, same view uh, by Kurt Tyke. Uh, postcard uh, publisher from Chicago. Uh, you have a color view and then you have a black and white view. Another um, white border view of the Sarin, a good view of the Sarin from uh, the north side. This view here is a nice panoramic view of the of Ephraim Cloister grounds. Supposedly this view was taken from the water tower of the Walter Moyer Company, which was next door, Knittingville next door. Moyer's mill was um, 
developed uh, from an earlier mill site um, a flouring mill and that flouring mill was built on an even earlier site where the uh, cloister paper, the second paper mill was located. The second mill was built 1756. Supposedly, and I've never seen this, there are foundation stones still in place in the old part of the water, Walter Moyer building from that earlier cloister paper mill. This is Joseph Clarence Zerfus and Helen Zerfus, the children of William and Annie Zerfus. Uh, Joe Mack, the late Joe Mack, told me one time that Helen here, um, his mother, apparently said that they were out working somewhere uh, in the fields and uh, the photographer wanted a view of people in cloister garb and they were called in, put sheets on um, to try to resemble cloister garb. And um, well, they don't look too happy about it because I guess they were interrupted from whatever they were doing. Um, this is an, what they, was known as an Albert type card from the Albert type company from Brooklyn, uh, New York. Albert type cards, um, the Albert type company existed from 1890 to 1952 and were in their time produced about 25,000 views. They were experts at what was called the colotype, later known as the Albertype. It was a process developed originally in the 1850s and they perfected it in the 1890s and produced many cards from that. We're gonna take a look now at the linen era cards. Uh, linen era cards, of course, from about 1930 to 1950, developed by Kurt Teich a, uh, that's T-E-I-C-H of Chicago. Tyke perfected what was known as the linen card. This is a very early linen card. You can't really see it very well, but it has what appears to be a very fine cloth-like texture on the card. He determined from, I guess, trial and error that when he was trying to produce mass produce cards, the cards it had a tendency, the ink had a tendency to soak through and it didn't work out very well. But he was able to figure out that if this card had a texture, it took the ink better and would not soak through. Uh, linen cards became very popular over the next 20 some years. It was a very early one. This is what people might have in mind more of what a, a linen card looks like. I'm not aware of there any cloister views that are looked have these very bright colors. And uh, uh, here's, of course, a couple views of the pagoda in Reading. But uh, linens became known as very bright, gaudy, you might even say gaudy colors, uh, very, became very popular. And Tyke, uh, uh, Kurt Tyke, again, issued thousands of cards uh, while they were in business. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the era between. Now, this is this ran the same time as the linen era, but as times got pretty tough during the 1930s and through 1940, 1940s, you saw um, a lot of monochrome cards, black and white usually. Here, of course, is a view of uh, the sarin's all. Uh, as you can see, the the sarin um, uh, is starting to really show its age there. Uh, the stucco work that was put on there at one time, you can see is falling off. Another monochrome card, I would suspect from the 1930s before the Commonwealth purchased the cloister. What's interesting about this view is this is taken on the third floor of the Sarin and uh, on the east end in what was known as the Struba, uh, the stove room, showing many artifacts that were stored in that area. Largely was not open. The first two floors had been turned into living space uh, as time went on after the celibates were gone. Third floor was kind of left alone and became known as the garret. And a lot of things were stored up there. As you can see, there are artifacts up there of some of which we can easily determine are still in the collection today. There's a bee scap and Sister of Paulina's basket, this large, uh, uh, clay uh, vessel here to hold fluids, another basket. Many of these stocking boards are in the collection today. Another monochrome card. I put this in here because it's the same exact view from the same publisher. One's a little bit more 
uh, was developed a little closer, uh, close up. The other one's a little bit further away. Same publisher. Uh, only on the top card, as you can see, they had the cloister near Denver, PA. On the bottom card, a later printing, I guess they got it right. They have it uh, as Ephra, PA. Here's where it says Denver. Here's Ephra. Same photographer. Another example of a, a monochrome card, uh, and there was a whole set of these that came out with different views of the cloister and of the and, and of the borough of Ephra. Very crudely done. Uh, often it looks a little crooked, but that's the way it was cut. Now we're going to look at a few um, photochrome cards from the photochrome era, which began around 1939, and really gained steam. I think in the 1950s, pretty much ending uh, the linen era. By 1956, linens were pretty much not produced anymore. This is an earlier photochrome or chrome card. Um, there has been some restoration work done here. You can see the buildings in this view uh, were covered with creosote to preserve them. But we know this card was at least before 1968 because the final restoration work on the Zoll was not performed at this time. These two windows here were replaced by a large center window um, in 1968. Here's another view of almost the same, um, from the same point. You can see at this point there was uh, linen planted in the field. The large center window is in place, so we know this card was uh, published after 1968. Many of the cloister views from that period of time were published by the Commonwealth, or at least paid for by the Commonwealth, by the PHMC. Uh, that is no longer the case. Many of the views now, if not all the views, are published and paid for by the Ephra Cloister Associates. And then many of those, many views are available in the store. I like this view here because it's uh, virtually the same view. Um, published by Tomlin from Northport, uh, New York. You can definitely see the creosote that was used on the buildings at one time to help uh, preserve them. But these were taken a little bit different time period. Uh, the main difference here is you can see some plantings were added on the bottom card to the view, which um, are not existing up here. This is a favorite view of mine for one real big reason is the fact that uh, nice view of Sarens all. Uh, this was published by Mel Horst of Whitmer in Lancaster County. Uh, as you notice, it's at least definitely before 1968 because the large center window is not here in place. This is pretty much the way uh, Edwin Wombaugh restored this all. He left, left the project here at effort in 1960. Wombaugh was responsible for bringing this cabin, this log cabin, onto the property as the guide station, the place where you got your ticket and you got your, a guided tour from the guides. This is a view of it in its original location, which today is a, a little bit of a flattened area in the grass. The stable building has not yet been constructed. It's the only reconstructed building on the cloister grounds, and it's right here, or would be right in here. In 1968, we do have a picture of this. There's a crane here that picked this building up and moved it 90 degrees uh, beside the stable. The stable's here, and uh, the, the old guide station was moved actually off the print uh, next to it. I don't know. I, I theorize that a lot of people, when they came to visit the cloister, weren't that interested in this building. It was moved here in 1949 by uh, G. Edwin Blumbaugh, the first architect. Uh, they were more interested in taking photographs of the historic buildings, particularly Sarans All. So this building got skipped. I'm not aware that we have any pictures of this in its original location, but here it is on a postcard. And by the way, this is an oversized postcard, a real big one that would have required more postage. A couple of earlier chromes, chrome views, uh, one in the kitchen, the first floor of the Saren on the top and a picture of the meeting room in the meeting house. Uh, what I really like about this view here is the fact that you can see the restoration has not been completed yet in that kitchen area. 
uh, you can see that the floor still has a brick section in it. Apparently that section there crumbled and was replaced by brick at some time. And uh, what had been another uh, back door to the Zoll, excuse me, to the Sarin uh, has been turned. Um, it was a window, but you can definitely see that it was framed out originally for a door. Bottom view, the, in 1968, they uh, put back the balconies in the meeting house. The Zoll meeting room looked like this with a ceiling completely across it for over 200 years. It only uh, had the balconies for about four years, from about 1741 to 1745, when the building was remodeled for use by the sisters. It looked more like this for about 200 years. Well, now we know that the balconies, of course, are reopened again. And this whole area here um, was taken out. And um, good view, though, of a, an interior view uh, prior to that major work in 1968. A view of the, um, of the grounds here. I'm thinking this was done about uh, at the end or very near the end of the restoration of the cloister in 1970. Harry Stauffer, who was a longtime volunteer here at the cloister uh, using the Orem printing press. Uh, this is not in the printing office. This is in the second floor of the bakery building. The printing office was only um, completed, uh, the restoration work, and that was only completed about 1968 or so in that area. And at that point, then the Orem press was moved down to uh, what is today the printing office. This is the second floor of the, of the bakery building. Harry also did a lot of printing and demonstrating at the Kutztown Folk Festival. This is not a cloister view, although it predicts, a, it, it portrays a cloister view. This is a uh, chrome view of, um, from the National Wax Museum, uh, which was uh, formerly next to Dutch Wonderland along Route 30. We're going to look at take a look at a couple of cards here that were used to advertise the uh, they were used by a business and had a cloister um, a theme to it. These two cards were issued by the Hotel Good or, and, and or there was a restaurant. You'll notice that the, the Hotel Good was located next door to the Effort National Bank on Main Street. And here they have a picture of uh, the cloister on the bottom and here with warm greetings Hotel Good and Ephra. Uh, a, uh, a golden era card um, with a cloister uh, picture on it. And not to be outdone, the Hotel Cocalico, which was located next, or excuse me, where the post office in Effort is today, also issued cards with uh, an Effort theme, also to advertise their hotel in Effort. And the last of these in the, in the program tonight is the Cloister Country Store, which was located along off of the, on the other side of the Route 322 ramp uh, that goes right aside of the cloister grounds. Uh, Norman, Ida, Norman and Ida Groff uh, ran the Cloister Country Store and they sold out in 1999 or so. Now when, um, what's really, what, what catches your eye here, at least caught my eye, was this building right here. This building was known as the Cottage by the Way. It was an early cloister building that was on the other side of Main Street. It stood in the corner of what is the gas station there now, the Arco gas station. And when that property was developed into the, the gas station, this was sold and Groff bought it and moved it to his property. My understanding is that uh, when the Groffs uh, um, retired, this was sold and was moved out of state. So there's a cloister building somewhere out of state. I'm, I'm not sure right at this point where it went, but um, something tells me Virginia, but um, this is an early cloister building in this view. We're gonna wind down the program here with a, with a little bit of fun. Postcards, uh, all the postcards we looked at were pretty serious uh, tonight. We're gonna look at some of what was known as novelty cards and not in the definition of a novelty card is anything that was added to a regular postcard view. Um, 
it had, well, I'll give you a, a better definition. It was a features beyond containing more than just a simple picture. It could have been a mechanical card that actually did something by moving a part of the card. It could have had something uh, extra uh, pasted to the card. Um, and, uh, or it could have been made in a different uh, material. Here's a regular postcard, but they added a real photo picture of the cloister buildings to the top. If you can see it, you'll notice that Sister House was spelled S-I-B-I-E-R by this publisher. But an example of a novelty card where they used, they used, they illustrated it with a real photo pasted on the card. Another example is a monument picture with some glitter added to it. You saw glitter added earlier to a card, but here's uh, some more glitter. And you'll find that a little bit of glitter on the flagpole. You'll find that on even on real photo cards, glitter was added to them. Card made of leather. I suspect this is now considered unmachinable and it would cost you a lot of extra money to send it today. But for one penny, you could send a card made of leather. Here is a postcard cut from a tree branch. The uh, picture was pasted to a piece of tree branch. Here's the bark. And this was postally used. It was sent to Virginia, although it wasn't for a penny during the penny era. It cost that person three cents to send it. Postcard made from wood. Uh, today, uh, unmachinable. On the back, it says first class postage required. Well, I'm sure it'd be a lot more than that because it's not machinable. And uh, one more novelty card, uh, sponges from Tarpon Springs, Florida. I put this in here for because I liked it and I got it. But there's examples of all these different kinds of sponges that are stapled on the front of this card. I can't imagine sending this through the mail. Um, supposedly things like this were actually put in an envelope and mailed. I've seen little bags of salt uh, stapled to views of the Great Salt Lake. And uh, there's other things like this where things were added to the card, uh, made it a little 3D. Down near the end here now, of course, we're going to look a little bit at the Continental eras. The Continental cards became more popular by 1970. Um, here's a view of the Saren and Saw, beautiful view, one of my favorite views, uh, postcard views. This is a continental card, four by six inches, a little bit bigger than uh, the standard size, three and a half by five and a half. Another continental card, a very recent card from, uh, excuse me, it was published in 2018, a photo by Craig Benner, who uh, also has furnished photos for other postcards over the years that were published by the Effort of Cloister Associates. Third floor of the Saren. Uh, this was the room where all those artifacts were in, in the earlier uh, view that we looked at. Uh, you're looking from east to west, all through all the doorways, all the way to the, the west side. Great view. And last but not least, we're going to look at a couple of rack cards uh, that were ma made to be used as postcards. Some of you viewers out there right remember the Silk City Diner, which is now Kaima, along 272. And you might also remember the Shillington restaurant. Rack card, postcard could be mailed as a postcard with a picture of the restaurant and the dining areas. And that's it for the night. We end with another continental view of the Saren Zoll. Um, I think if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. Hey, thank you very much, Gary. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I will facilitate them. We do have one question here, Carrie, from Mike Weber. Is there any connection between Reverend Pence and our current vice president? That's a good question. Uh, Reverend Pence was P-E-N-T-Z. So I don't think there's a connection. Very good. I always enjoyed looking at the, the older postcards with the, with the older views prior to restoration. I, I think they're, they, they've always um, intrigued me to see the different connect, connections between the buildings and, and the state of the buildings. Um, so uh, Jared Bateman has a 
Question here, did the interest in Shaker spur development of the effort of Cloisters as a tourist attraction historic site? In the case of the Shakers, members of the commune stayed on the grounds as they became attractions, but the Cloister commune ended before it became an attraction. I'm gonna stick my neck out here and say that uh, I think cloister, the, the cloister grounds and buildings might have been a, uh, became more, um, uh, were, were more um, of an attraction of a curiosity before the Shakers were. And that might be because there were, uh, you know, the Shakers, a lot of those communities were still ongoing in, um, in the uh, latter part of the 1800s. But I think uh, some of the interest in the cloister was also stimulated by the centennial of the United States in 1876. Um, of course, there were people living here too. There were church members of the German Seventh-day Baptist Church living here on the grounds as well. It wasn't like these buildings were just uh, were, were vacant. Um, okay. I hope that answered his question. Uh, Terry Pierce wants to know, when did they start putting glitter on cards? Uh, another good question. Um, the, the earliest cards I've known is like from the uh, undivided back era. Um, if it was before that, I, I don't know. But I would say, you know, certainly between 1900 and 1907, there was already glitter appearing on uh, postcards. Uh, sometimes a lot of glitter, sometimes a, a little bit. But even real photo cards were decorated with glitter as well. Okay. Anybody else have any more questions? Ah. So um, Michael's reminding me that we have a little advertisement here. We have our upcoming winter history class uh, that will begin Thursday mornings in February. And um, he's going to give us a little uh, advertisement for that. In the meantime, Brenda Regal wants to know, was the glitter added by the manufacturer or the sender? That's a good question. Um... I'm going to say it was added by the menu. That's a good question. I think it was not added by the sender. I think you bought it that way. Uh, but who put it on uh, the manufacturer or maybe the seller or the uh, that's a really good question. Um, I'll try to find that out. And Michael, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself to talk a little bit about history class? In the meantime, if anybody thinks of any other questions, please put them in the chat. And we'll double check that before we conclude for the evening. But Michael, do you wanna talk about uh, history class? Sure, uh, I welcome everybody to join us for our winter history class uh, on starting on March the 4th, or excuse me, February 4th, February 4th. And what prompted this was the, the question about Ephrata as a tourist attraction. Uh, we're actually gonna talk a little bit about Ephrata as a place for visitors uh, starting back in the 18th century already. Uh, we're gonna do that the first class but we have a whole series of great programs featuring a wide arrangement of uh, assortment of topics, including uh, some art, some interesting characters from history. We'll do a little armchair traveling to some historic sites in other parts of the, the country and the state. So uh, please check out our website and the details uh, are there about our winter history class starting on February 4th. And Lydia has kindly posted the link on the webpage for all the information for registering, et cetera, et cetera, the full schedule uh, on our website. And that is in the chat. So if you want to uh, copy and paste that to your browser, you can uh, bookmark that for yourself to go back to later. Registrations are now open. Uh, we will be sending you the links each week to join. Once you're registered, we'll be sending you the links each week to join the uh, sessions and they're going to run from nine about nine to twelve pretty much the usual uh thing we all will miss the refreshments in between but uh you'll have to make your own <laughs> all right so i'm not seeing any other questions so i think we will go ahead and conclude for the evening i'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening uh february and marches uh went virtual programs we'll still continue to be held the second Thursday evening 
of the month. The February and March are gonna be sort of uh, more artifact focused. February, we'll be talking about items uh, relating to the WPA in our collection, including two new acquisitions. And then um, March, we're gonna be talking about some of our newer acquisitions from the last several years. So look for information coming your way about those and we'll look forward to seeing you next month, either at history class or on the virtual program. Thank you all for attending tonight.